Dear Heavenly Father, we just humbly bow before you this morning or this evening, and we thank you, God, for the opportunity to be here, Lord. And we pray, Father, for you to work in our midst in a mighty way, Father. I pray that you will speak through me tonight and that you would magnify your name in a great way. I pray, Lord, in the storms that are coming this week, they wouldn't be as bad as they're saying, uh, but will we leave those things in your hand, Father, and I just pray that you give everyone safety on the roads who will be traveling in the midst of these storms. Father, we just pray that your name would be glorified and honored in everything that we say and do. Be with me tonight, Father. Please speak through me and magnify your name in a greater way. In Jesus' most precious and holy name I pray, amen. All right, all right, so uh, let's go to, uh, to Luke chapter 1 again. Seems like I'm always in Luke. Oh, I keep forgetting that. How in the world can you forget this? All right, let's take our Bibles and repeat after me. I believe that this is the Word of God. I believe every Word of God is true because it's impossible for God to lie. Amen. Praise God. Great confession right there. Amen. All right. Okay, so uh, the title of the message is Mary Investigates the Angel's Sign. He told her, we looked at this this morning, he told her in verse number 36, Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. And so, right away, Mary is going to check in on these things. And so, uh, we're looking at, uh, uh, see how far we get in this tonight, but there's basically two main points. Elizabeth encourages Mary, which is primarily where the message will be. And then if we have the time, uh, Mary rejoices in, in God, my Savior, which would be God, God her Savior, which uh, tells us that Mary had to be saved. She refers to God as her Savior. So she, had, she was a sinner that had to be saved. So people that teach that she was sinless, they teach a false doctrine. She was not sinless. A very righteous young woman, uh, great character and all that, very pure, but not sinless, amen? There is nobody sinless. And uh, part of the error that teaching is that she had to be sinless in order to bring the Christ child in the world. Well, if you th think, that, think through that, then her mother would have had to have been sinless to bring Mary into the world sinless to bring the Christ child into the world. You see, it doesn't stop. And so it's just foolishness. It's just, once again, uh, people getting away from the plain uh, teaching of the Word of God. So... Uh, so Mary, we looked at this this morning, Mary uh, gets the visitation from Gabriel and he gives her the announcement that she is going to bring the Christ child into the world. So then verse 39 tells us, and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste in a city of Judah. So she does this with haste. Now you have to really admire Mary because the journey she's about to make is 80 miles. Um, she is going to be in hill country, and it's, and it's dangerous. It's not uh, like today. I mean, today it's, it's dangerous to travel, but there's some safety things in place today. You, can, you have police and state troopers and things of that nature. Back then, you had none of that. And this is very extremely dangerous. Most people would travel in groups, but she needs to get to uh, where Elizabeth is to confirm everything that the angel had told her. So she is doing this in haste. She's not, she's not taking a whole lot of time. She's not dragging her feet. She's heading on this journey. And this is just one incredible journey. And she's a very young girl, very young girl. I, I like to think that she was 15, but a lot of scholars say she may have been even younger than that, 14 years old, maybe younger. So consider a young girl just going on an 80-mile trip. She's not driving there. There's no cars. So it's quite a long walk, amen? Think about it somewhere around here that's 80 miles away, and then think about walking there. That's what she did. And so it's just absolutely incredible. She made haste. And so 
uh, verse uh, number 40 tells us, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And uh, saluted just means that she greeted her and they had a respectful way of, re of greeting one another and that's what she did. So now, when Elizabeth is, is encouraging Mary, we can break this down into three different sections. Mary receives a personal confirmation Mary witnesses a physical confirmation, and Mary hears a prophetic confirmation about her bringing the Christ child into the world. So first of all, there is uh, Mary receives the personal confirmation. It tells us verse number, uh, verse number uh, 40, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So you say, well, what, what is the personal confirmation? Well, imagine this. Imagine that Elizabeth's back is turned to her when Mary comes in the house and she turns around, six months pregnant. Yeah, there you go. There's the physical confirmation, the, or excuse me, the personal confirmation. She, she's with child. You know, I still, we had, what, four kids, and uh, I still remember the first one more than any of them, and that's because I was away. Uh, Pamela... Uh, got pregnant, and then three months later, I had left the country, and then I came back, and when I came back, I mean, it was just like a week before Shanda was born, and so when I am looking from the plane, I'm looking for her outside, and I saw her, but then I saw her turn sideways to say something to her mother, and boy, talk about culture shock, Woo, that, <laughs> that belly was sticking out there. I said, wow, wow, then it, you know, it really hit. I've been away so long, I did not, uh, I did not think about that. And, that and, and back when I was in, just like Tom, you know, we didn't have this Skype and cell phones and all the stuff people have today. You know, everything was all, you got letters, that was it. Hey, man, you, got, you sent letters. Yeah, and you didn't see each other. Unless somebody sent you a picture, you didn't see them that, that whole time. And when I was in Diego Garcia, you couldn't even make a normal phone call. It was all, it was over a ham radio. And so uh, it was a lot different than it is today, amen? But, uh, and so this is how it was with uh, Mary. She, she has no communication with Elizabeth other than to go down there and talk to her. And she re receives a personal, a personal confer, uh, confirmation. Now think about some of the things they have in common that neither one of them uh, might be, well, Elizabeth won't be aware of, Mary will be aware of. They both talked to Gabriel personally, amen? So they both were able to meet Gabriel and to have a conversation with him about their future uh, destiny. And like I said this morning, angels don't do this. They don't casually come up and have conversations with you. Now, I do believe that, that angels uh, interact in our life but for the most part, we're not aware. Angels aren't aware. Amen? And so, uh, if you're expecting Gabriel to show up and have a conversation with you, don't look for that this side of heaven. Amen? And you might not get it the other side of heaven either. But, uh, but understand that in this particular case with these two women, it was necessary. And that's one thing that they have in common. So, Mary receives a personal confirmation. She sees, physically sees her uh, pregnant. But then Mary uh, witnesses a physical confirmation. And so here's the physical confirmation in verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? The babe leaped in her womb. This is incredible. The babe hears Mary's voice. This tells us a lot about babies before they're born, amen? They're aware of, of what's going on. They might not understand or perceive everything that's going on, but they hear what's going on around them. In fact, you even have doctors nowadays saying, talk to your baby while it's in your belly. And, and, and for the dad to talk to the baby and, and let the baby get familiar with the voice of the father, because they have perception. Now, none of that bodes well for people who believe in abortion, amen? I mean, what if uh, Elizabeth believed in abortion, right? She would have killed John the Baptist. She would have killed him, amen? 
He was alive and he was a person in her womb. In her womb. And the same is true for every baby. Every baby. And when he hears the voice of Mary, he leaps. And I can imagine, well, I can't imagine because I never carried a child, but uh, I guess you women could imagine what that might have been like having a baby leap in your womb. But, uh, but there was a physical confirmation. Now here's John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one who be the, who crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way uh, of the Lord. And so, and, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost and she spoke out with a loud voice. And so now, uh, and, and this is the thing with being filled with the Spirit, and you follow it through the Word of God, it's always associated with presenting the Word of God, whether you're preaching it or teaching it. This thought of being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, that's baloney. That's a 19th century made-up doctrine. You'll not find it anywhere else in history. Amen? It doesn't exist. It does exist in paganism and cultures that, that were involved in paganism where they would talk in ecstatic speech. They called it the language of the gods. That's what they would call it. But in Christianity, speaking in tongues was only and ever the ability to speak in a language that you never learned, and now you did it. And you didn't just keep on doing it forever. You only did it for a specific purpose for a, a period of time. And it was to be a witness to unbelieving Israel, according to 1 Corinthians 14, and if there was nobody to, to interpret what you're saying, you weren't supposed to say anything. So if you follow the guidelines of 1 Corinthians 14, uh, all your charismatic churches violate that whole chapter and the practice of what they do. In fact, it's in that chapter it says uh, the woman should remain silent in the church. The context is speaking in tongues because it's dealing with revelation and teaching. And so... If a woman should remain silent in the church, and you go into these charismatic churches, and 90% of the people speaking in tongues are women. And the modern day movement that started in the early 1900s was by two women out of Oklahoma. Is that incredible or what? You see, this is a lot of information that's interesting that most people don't, don't think about. And just, you've got to think of where did things start? Where did it come from? How did it have its beginning? And so, and so now she's filled with the Holy Ghost and she is going to uh, talk to Mary and she is going to uh, say a few things here. So first of all, Elizabeth's message pronounces a blessing on Mary. Verse number 42, And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So blessed art thou among among women. Now once again, he, she's not worshiping Mary. She's not setting up a form of worship. In fact, there's a certain denomination that uses this verse as a prayer. And they start praying. And they say this to the Virgin Mary as they're praying to the Virgin Mary. And all, all that is wrong. None of that is based in the, do, in the Bible. It's all corrupt doctrine. And so here, what you have here is, is Elizabeth is simply saying, blessed art thou among women. Why is she blessed among women? Because she's bringing the Messiah into the world. And this was your desire. This was your desire. If you were a, a Jewish woman and you were a Trump from the tribe of Judah, your hope was that maybe you could bring the Christ child into the world. In fact, uh, well, I don't want to get into that. I was going to talk about one of the Old Testament prophecies in Daniel, but I'm almost, almost going to leave that alone. But the desire, this was the desire of every woman that she would bring in the Christ child. Amen? And this is why she's blessed, because she gets to do it. She gets to bring him into this world. And so she's blessed. And, and we would, and, and we, we don't want to diminish from Mary's importance. All right? Because sometimes you'll hear me preach this way and and, uh, and I'm talking about uh, how another doctrine isn't correct. And you might want to think, you might think that uh, I think I don't have a high opinion of Mary. That's not true. I do have a high opinion of Mary. I just don't worship her, amen? And I understand her in the light of Scripture. I also have a high opinion of Peter, and I have a high opinion of Paul, and I have a high opinion of David, all these people, and Moses, Amen. But I don't go praying to them, and I don't go worshiping them, and I don't set up shrines around them. 
I just appreciate for the way in which God used them. Amen? And only hope that in some small way, I can be used of God. In some small way. Amen? Uh, yeah, I don't know. You ever think about your life? You wonder sometimes. You know, God, have you ever been able to really use me? Really, you know, work, work through my heart and life? And so... Uh, this, is, this is why she's blessed, because she's getting to bring in the, the Christ child. So, so her message is a personal blessing on Mary. It's also had a great words of blessing for the child. So notice, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. What's the fruit of the, her womb? Who is the fruit of her womb? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now I was listening to... Uh, uh, Friends of Israel on the way over here, I, I just love listening to that program. And uh, anyway, uh, I couldn't help but think that as Mary is carrying this babe in her womb and she's going to give birth to it, this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? They, they were, they, Laura, Lorna Simcox, uh, which I, I knew her husband, but I haven't talked to him in many, many years, Tom Simcox, but, uh, but her, uh, she was sharing her testimony about being a Jew. She felt like, like Christians bowed down to a man where Jews worshiped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so she was giving her testimony. And when she was talking about that, I be, that's when I begin to think about this, that this is, Jesus is, Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And even as the, as the babe, we look at the babe in the manger, and don't forget that that babe in the manger is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? And that babe in the, in the manger is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. Now, it'll be 33 years from this time till it happens, but he's the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. He's going to be sacrificed for our sins. He's going to be bruised for our iniquities. And this is the God, the God of all creation. Amen? Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Yes, for sure. For sure he's blessed. He is Messiah. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And he's worthy and deserving of all praise, all glory, all honor. Amen? And so this is what she's talking about when she says, Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And then, uh, uh, see, Elizabeth has a blessing uh, of herself. And she says in uh, verse number uh, 43, And once is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. And I love the way that, that Elizabeth says this. The mother of my Lord. She knows that the baby within Mary's womb isn't just any old child. But this is Messiah. This is her Lord. Amen? And don't mistake this, because this is another misteaching. People will look at this verse, and right away they say, well, look at Mary, the mother of God. It never says Mary's the mother of God, amen? And she's not the mother of God. As all she did is the vehicle to bring the eternal God wrapped in human flesh into the world, amen? She's not the mother of God, for crying out loud, but she did bring our Lord. And so in that sense, as she has to take on the role of a mother in raising Jesus, don't ever lose sight of who he is all the way. There was one time that Mary started to lose sight of that, remember? When Jesus was about 12 years old, and they were, he was in the temple, and the caravan that they were traveling went left. They left and headed back to Nazareth, and Jesus was left behind. They didn't realize he was left behind. They went back looking for him, Mary and Joseph, and no doubt like any parent would be, you're beside yourself, first with fear, then with anger, when you find him, amen? Where have you been? And I can see her, where have you been, boy? What are you doing? And he said, woman, don't you know I must be about my father's business? He is still God at 12 years old. But then the Bible tells us that he did what? He submitted himself to them. So that even though he is God, he still submits himself to his parents. So for all the young people here tonight, if it was good enough for Jesus to submit himself to his mom and dad, then it's good enough for you. Amen? 
Parents should at least give me an amen for that. Come on. Go get it, preacher. Amen. Uh, so anyway, so anyway, uh, so so she so what, what, what verse am I on? Uh, verse 44. All right. Uh, all right. All right. Verse, well, let's run into it from verse 43. And whence is this to me that my that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So it's like John sleeping in her womb gave her confirmation that Mary is carrying the Christ child. And, uh, and so this is absolutely incredible. And they were already aware of John's future, what John was supposed to be. And here is now Mary and uh, and Elizabeth meeting face to face, lo, for lo, as soon as, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. You got to love that, amen? You got to, to love that verse. All right, so then look at uh, verse number 45. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Blessed is she that believed. Why? How, well, look at us. We get promises from God, but do we believe them? And I was thinking about that the other day. How, how often do we really believe the promises of God? How often do we pray the promises of God? Look up what God has, now what God has promised you, not what God has promised Israel. That's a problem today, is people will take promises that God gave to Israel and apply them to themselves, and you can't do that. You, you've got to take the promises that God gave to you and pray them for yourself and believe them, amen? We need to do that. We need to accept the promises of God. And Mary believed. She didn't doubt in her heart. Not at all. So there's no doubt. She believed. She trusted. She clung to this blessed uh, promise and message that was given her. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things with the Lord, uh, which were told her from the Lord. And so how did the Lord tell her? He told her through the angel Gabriel. But nonetheless, it was the word of the Lord. How does the Lord speak to you today? Right here. You might be reading words off a page of the Bible, but it's still the Lord speaking to you. Now, what you have to be, what I have to be, is like Mary and believe. Believe the word that God has spoken to us through the Scripture. Amen? We need to believe this. We don't need to be running uh, for prophetic utterance and all this other nonsense that goes on, half of which cannot even be verified. Let me say 99% can't even be verified. And it just aggravates me that so many people buy into that, and ignore the written word of God. All right, now, uh, Mary's response to that is incredible, because in Mary's response, every one of her responses are based in Scripture, which tells us that, that she knew the word of God. Now, I'm not going to take the time tonight, though last year I think it was, I took a whole message just looking at all these verses where they come from the Old Testament of what she's saying here. It tells us, it shows us that she was very familiar with the Word of God. She wasn't just a girl that was Jewish and that's what she was and did what Jews do. No, she was a girl that knew the Scriptures, that knew what the Word of God said. She knew it so well, she wove it into her life. And it became a part of who she is, amen? And this is what it should be for us. Our life should be Scripture woven in and, and through us. Amen? Uh, we, we should really not just say we believe this book, but actually believe it, live in it, making it part of our life, trusting what it has to say. So now notice in Mary's response what she says here. And Mary said, My Lord... Uh, and my soul, excuse me. Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. She's magnifying the Lord. She's praising God. This is another lost art in modern Christianity that we have got to get back to us learning how to pour our heart out to God in praise. Not just always, you know, asking for things, but learning to praise Him. And you say, well, I don't know what to do. Well, find verses that praise God and pray them back to God. 
I mean, there's been many times uh, I've taken things from Revelation where God's being worshipped, and I make that, personalize that, and I make that part of, of my prayer. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, amen? Uh, praising God and magnifying the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. There it is. She calls God her Savior. God my Savior. If you have to have a Savior, it means that you're a sinner. If you have to have a Savior, it means you're a sinner that's bound for a devil's hell. And your only hope is the Savior to save you from that. Amen? So Mary had to be saved just like everybody else. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And that's true. That's true. He looked on Mary. He regarded the low estate of his, of, uh, his uh, handmaiden, his, his servant. He looked on her. And because he looked on her with this favor, behold, from hence, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And, and we do, once again, we do call her blessed. We do honor her for what she did in her life, but we don't worship her. We don't pray to her. Amen? And she didn't ascend into heaven. She died like every other person and went to heaven. Amen? We've got to, I, you know, I, I feel bad because I tell people these things and, and, and sometimes it's like, well, you're just, you're picking on a certain church. I'm not picking on a certain church. There's truth and there's error. Amen? And if people have been told something that's false, then it's our responsibility to tell them what the truth is. Amen? Tell them what the truth is. And listen, if nobody told me what the truth is, I would have died going to hell in those systems. But thank God there was a fellow that came up to me and said, Bob, do you know if you died, you go to heaven? I think so. Pretty good fella. Good fellas don't go to heaven. Amen? Save people go to heaven. And so he shared the gospel with me. All right, let's move on from that. Uh, verse number 49. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. She's praising God in this reaction to what Elizabeth has said. She's in this mode of praise, praising God. And she says, for he that is mighty, that's a reference to God. She's referring to him as mighty, hath done great things. And holy, uh, to me, done great things. And holy is his name. What's the great thing he done to her? He took a virgin and through the power of the Holy Spirit conceived his son in her. Absolutely incredible, is it not? Verse number 50. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. Did you get that? His mercy, his mercy isn't just there because he's God and he's kind and benevolent. His mercy is on them that fear him. That fear him. Do you fear God? I would venture to say that the problem with America, not picking on the liberals and the unbelievers, but the Christians themselves, is that there's no fear of God amongst Christians. Amen? Christians do not fear God. They look to God the same way they look to Santa Claus. Who in the world is afraid of Santa Claus? There ain't nobody afraid of Santa Claus. Well, sometimes you see little kids crying, but that's different. Amen? Most people are not afraid of Santa Claus. Amen? And Santa Claus is what? He gives you things. All right? Jesus is not Santa Claus, amen? He is not Santa Claus that arbitrarily gives people things. He is a God to be feared, adored, and worshipped, amen? He's a God that deserves our reverence and our awe and our respect. He's a God that deserves us to, yeah, be a little afraid at times, amen? Amen? Why is that? The same way I was afraid of my dad at times. I knew I was going to get the paddle. And it's funny because uh, Kenzie was found the, the paddle that we had years ago when the, the boys were growing up. I say when the boys were growing up because he never had to use it on Shanda. She was a good kid. Well, that's not true. She did get spanking from time to time. But, uh, but uh, Kenzie found that old paddle. And her dad must have told her about it. And she, she said, does this hurt? And then she's trying to tap herself to see if it hurts. It's like there was some power in the board that when the board touches you, it, it hurts. And she said, she said, my dad said, they try to hide this thing. 
And I said, yeah, no, no doubt they did. Uh, I tried to hide my mom's too. And my mom, my mom was vicious with that bat, I'll tell you what. There was this wrought iron railing. And to get her point across, she could smack that thing. And man, it was like thunder, boom. And uh, one day we had gotten her riled up, and she smacked that thing, and, the, and that uh, spinner, that, that, that paddle just splintered it, busted up. And we were like, yeah, praise God. Well, we didn't say praise God. We didn't know God back then. But we were like excited. Yeah, the paddle's busted. Oh, you think so? I'm getting a wooden spoon. <laughs> Every Italian mother has a wooden spoon, believe me. But, and it does the same, it does the, has the same effect as the paddle, amen. But, but anyway, I'm digressing. I'm way off course of, of the message here. Linda, where am I? <laughs> where am I supposed to be? Uh, where am I at? 51, verse 51, amen, thank you. All right, so, so uh, in verse 50 it says, His mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He scattered the proud in the imagination of the hearts. I imagine there was a lot of women in that day that thought they deserved the right to be the mother of the Messiah. But guess what? None of them were it. All the great people, all the important women of the day, None of them were it. Mary was the one that God had His hand and His eye upon. Amen? And we should rejoice in that. I'm always telling you, you don't have to be somebody famous or popular. It's all you just have to be is willing to be used by God. That's all you have to do. And don't look for glory for yourself, but look for glory for God. And these other women that probably desired to be the mother of Messiah... They probably desired it for their own glory, you know, not even realizing what it would cost to be that great woman to bring in the Christ child, because that was going to come at a great price. I remember back in Bible college, everybody would always admire uh, D.L. Moody and George Whitfield and John uh, Wesley, but the thought of my heart always was, that's, a great, that's great to desire to be like that, but is it the fame that you're after? then you're after the wrong thing. And have you ever considered the price that these men pay? Spurgeon and all these great men of God paid a huge price to be used in the way that they were. They were attacked, maliciously attacked. George Whitfield, people talk about the thousands that filled the fields to hear Whitfield preach. But do you know there were times when Whitfield was chased out of out of villages, and they're throwing rocks at him, and they're throwing vegetables, and he's trying to preach in the open air, and they're throwing rotten vegetables at him. Does that sound glamorous? How about the great hymn writer, Charles Wesley? Uh, Charles R R Wesley had people make fun of him. The, the theater would uh, put on plays where they made fun of, of Charles, of, of, am I saying it right, Cindy? John... Well, John Wesley was the preacher. Charles Wesley was the brother that wrote a lot of the hymns in our hymnal. And they would make plays, they would write plays making fun of him. Making fun of him. And so these guys paid a heavy price, a heavy price for whatever notoriety they may have had on this side of heaven. It came at a great price. Are you willing to pay that price? Are you willing to spend the hours that they spent in the Word of God and in prayer, drawn close to God. Amen? Because the power comes from God. It doesn't, I mean, we live in the day of the electronic personality. People see somebody on TV and they go, oh, look at that mighty man of God. Really? Really? You don't know that. You only know what they want you to see. Amen? These men of God, John Wesley would fast twice a week, Thursday, uh, Wednesdays and Fridays. There were his fast days where he disciplined himself and he fasts and prayed. He prayed every day. He prayed long prayers. In fact, someone said to him, he said, John, if the Lord was coming today, is there anything that you would do different than you're doing now? If you knew the Lord was coming at midnight tonight, is there anything different you would do? You know what he said? He said, I wouldn't do doing anything different. I would just keep doing what I'm doing. That's how it should be for all of us. There shouldn't be anything we need to change. We should be ready to meet our Lord. 
And so he said, he has showed strength with his arm. He has stretched the, he had scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. He hath hopened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. It's a beautiful uh, song of Mary here in response to what Elizabeth told her. And, and like I said, everything, every verse it can be connected with an Old Testament verse showing how well she knew the Scripture. And then in verse 56, and Mary abode with her about three months. All right, so remember, Elizabeth is six months pregnant. She stays there for three months. That brings her up to nine months. This is why I believe she was there when John was born. I just can't see a woman saying, well, see you later, Elizabeth. Hope things go well with that baby. No, I think she stayed there that she was there when John was born, and then she went back. So Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her house. And my own personal opinion, because the Bible doesn't really give us uh, timing to some of these events, my own personal opinion is that's when Joseph finds out, when Mary comes back and she's visibly with child, three months pregnant now, and Mary just lays it on her. And that's, that's a lot to take in, amen? That's a lot to take in. But, uh, I mean, there's also the possibility that, that she could have uh, told him before she left, and being gone three months gave him time to think about what he was going to do, because we know from Matthew, he did think about it. He didn't just make a decision on a whim. So maybe, maybe he did tell her. Maybe she did tell him before he left. But she left quickly, I know that. She left quickly. She left in haste. Now think about all the gossips in town that aren't privy to everything that went on. Well, you know that Mary, she took, out, she took off out of here pretty quick. Yeah, wonder what all that's about. I don't know. I don't know. You know? And then here comes Jesus, you know. But hey, this was all part of the sacrifice of bringing in the Christ child. So the question comes back to us yet again. What are we willing to sacrifice to bring glory to God, to carry out His will? What are we willing to be made uh, fun of, uh, people to ridicule us? What are, we, uh, what are we willing, how far are we willing to go? Amen? And, and I find the biggest part with witnessing is people are afraid of rejection. They're afraid of being made fun of. But you shouldn't let that hinder you because you're talking about another person's eternal destiny that's weighed in the balance and you have the opportunity to alter that. You have the opportunity to be the one to bring them the message of God that they will embrace that you might be saved. I mean, where would I be today if Bubba Ross didn't have the guts to say, Bob, do you know if you died, you would go to heaven? Do you, do you know that? Are you sure? You know? It's amazing. It's amazing. You have to be willing to pay the price. And I got to tell you, I don't want to say that the military is, is any rougher than any place else, but uh, unbelievers can be pretty rough on guys in the military that are believers. And uh, so you really... You were up against it when you come to faith. But to me, I didn't care. I just thought, this is the greatest message I ever heard. I didn't get saved out of desperation because my life was all messed up. I got saved out of response to the truth. I heard the truth, and it made absolutely perfect sense. And I asked God to save me. Amen. And, uh, and it's amazing, uh, because if you met anybody that knew me before I was saved, they would tell you, man, God did something amazing in his life. And I remember one time at Walmart, these kids were talking about partying, living it up, whatever they were doing. And I, I don't remember what I said to them 
uh, but I said something to them about it. And they said, oh yeah, choir boy, what do you know about partying? And I just smiled at him. I said, yeah, yeah, what do I know? And I walked away. And I thought, if they only knew where I came from, amen. It's amazing. It's grace. And it's a work that only God can do. Let him do it in your heart if he's never done it before. And if you're saved and you know you're saved, let him do a work in your life where you just fully consecrate yourself to him, to walk with him, to honor him, regardless of what it costs you to walk with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the eternal word of God and the truths of the word of God. We thank you for the examples of people and the life, uh, uh, the way that you use their life for your glory and honor and, way, and the way that they were willing to, to suffer and sacrifice to serve you, God. Help us, God, to have the same mindset, Lord. Not that we want to suffer, but help us to be willing if that's what it meant. And help us, God, to bring greater glory to your name in everything that we say and do. And as we continue on with this Christmas season, Father, help us not to get caught up in the gifts and the presents and the lights and all the celebration and the fanfare, but help us to always remember there was a reason that you came into this world. Help us to always remember you're not just any old baby in that manger, but you're God, you're God Almighty, wrapped in human flesh coming on a mission to save our wretched souls. Thank you, God, for saving my soul and giving me new life. I pray that this life of mine would in some small way bring glory to you. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. All right, so if Cindy will come and play the piano for us, if you take your hymnal, uh, 